Thank you so much. Praise God. Oh, God is good. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we want to uh, begin tonight once again in the book of Habakkuk chapter 2. And uh, we're going to continue with this series that we started last Wednesday, just simply entitled Activate. Activate. And we're talking about activating the power and the plan of God in your life, activating your purpose and your destiny within the local church. And how that when you get involved in the local church and you get involved in doing things for God, how that that anointing and that presence on that local body begin to flow into your life. And in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2, the Lord said to Habakkuk, He said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. And we made mention uh, last week that, of course, the vision that God gives the pastor of a local church, he writes that vision. One of the definitions for the word vision is simply this, revelation, divine revelation. And so the vision of a church then is a revelation of what God wants to do in that body. All right? The vision of our church, obviously, is building faith and framing worlds by the Word of God. The vision of this church is to build people's faith and frame worlds by the Word of God. And we're raising up a distribution center of the Word of Faith, producing life, city, state, nation, and world. Amen. Now, that is the divine revelation for this body. That's the divine revelation of this body. Now, in Proverbs 29... And verse 18, Proverbs 29 and verse 18. A familiar passage of Scripture, but notice it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law happy is he. Now notice that. Where there is no vision, the people perish. One translation says they run wild. All right. Another one says they cast off restraint. This is true in a local church. It's true in your life. It's true in your marriage. It's true in any area. If I don't have a vision for what I'm doing, then I have no restraint. I talked about finances earlier and a budget. You know what a budget is? A vision for your money. It gives you vision about where things are going. Do you see this? You have a vision. When, when you sit down... Uh, uh, and, and you forecast things in your life. You're creating a vision. You're giving anybody involved in that circumstance a revelation of what you want to do. All right? Christians without a vision perish. All right? There's an element of their life that's, that's, that's going to die, that's going to perish. Those that will receive and act on the on, on the part of the pastor's vision, God gives them to perform, will experience the supernatural working of God in their life. When you act on the part of the vision of your local church that God gave you to be a part of, then what begins to happen is the supernatural working of God will begin to be experienced in your life. When I begin to act on that part of the vision that God gives me, no matter what it may be. And, and we're talking about helps ministry. And we've defined helps ministry as having enough loving people serving. Helps. Having enough loving people serving. All right? Well, when someone gets involved in the helps ministry, they get involved in, in the vision. All right? And what begins to happen then is that the working of God supernaturally can begin to function and flow in their lives. Now, I've been in the church my whole life. I mean, my entire life, I've been involved in some concept, uh, some way with the local church. My mother went into labor with me preaching. All right? So, my whole life, I've been in the local church. 
And the most blessed people I've seen, the most solid people, the, the people that had the greatest desire to do things for God were people that got hooked up with what God was doing in their local body. In whatever capacity it may have been. Whether it was, it was helping out in the ushers, helping out in the greeters, helping out in the children's ministry. Of course, back then we didn't call it children's ministry. It was Sunday school, all right, or something of that nature, or offering takers, <laughs> whatever it may be. But the point is, whether you get involved in the usher department, the children's ministry, youth ministry, whether you get involved in AV, whatever you're getting involved in nursery ministry, what you're doing is you're far, than, far more than just filling a hole or far more than just doing something in the church, you're attaching yourself and connecting yourself with the supernatural ability of God. All right, Every time that you get involved, something begins to change. So the pastor writes the vision. And the ministry of helps is there to uplift and support his vision for that church. Whatever it may be. Hallelujah. And this calling to pastor is supernaturally given and endowed. Notice in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we'll, we'll look here in verse 1. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now understand, first of all, that a bishop is a title. It's not a gift. It's not a ministry gift. All right? I mean, how do you bishop? It's, you know, you can teach, you can pastor, you can evangelize. But here's the point that I'm making. The, the word just simply means overseer. The overseer of the local church is the pastor. All right? So he says, if the man desire an office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop must be blameless, husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Notice, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, notice this, how can he take care of the church of God? So that's the role of the pastor, is to take care, to oversee, to watch over the church of God, the local body, the local assembly. Hallelujah. Now, the Greek word for pastor is the same word for shepherd. It's a Greek word, poimen, P-O-I-M-E-N. It's the pastor and shepherd are interchangeable. Now, in the New Testament, you'll only see the word pastor one time. Ephesians chapter 4, all right, where it lists the five-fold ministry gifts. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Now, there are references over and over through the New Testament to the office of bishop or to the office of overseer. It's the same office. Now, I'm going through this for a reason. This office of the pastor, the role of the pastor is to see that the spiritual needs of the congregation, his flock, are met. That's the role of the pastor. Notice here in uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, one of my favorite scriptures, especially as it concerns this office and role of the pastor. Now I'm outlining this as we, we're, we're going to look at the, the helps ministry. Acts 20 verse 28. This is, this is Paul. He's talking to uh, pastors here in Ephesus. He's met with them. They've had a, a great conference, if you will, and now he's about to go across the sea and start other churches, and he's leaving Ephesus. And he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Pastoring is not a job that you get paid for. It is a, it is a, it is a 
office that the Holy Spirit has put that person in. Ministry is not a job, it's a calling. And he said the Holy Spirit made you overseers to, to what? To notice, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So notice this. This office of the pastor, the role of the pastor, is to take care of the needs of the spiritual flock. Not just to preach, not just to, 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 to be there to have a ministry. It's to take care of the spiritual needs of the flock, to feed the flock of God which is among you. Now notice 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Notice, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint. In other words, you're not made to do it. You do it willingly. Not for filthy lucre, money's not the aim, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That's the pastor's crown. You do this, you feed the flock of God that's among you. You do it the right way. You take care of the spiritual needs of, of your flock. And when Jesus appears, you'll get a crown that nobody can take from you. All right? That's, that's, that's part of this pastoral office. So notice that it is an office that is supernaturally given. Supernaturally given. These are the responsibilities of the pastor. Now, if you look in 1 Timothy 3 again, And remember that these epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, they're what we refer to as the pastoral epistles. And it's when you read all through chapter 3 here, Paul says, uh, I'm writing these things to you. And he said, if I tarry long, it's so I can inform you how you should behave yourself in the church. The local church is what he's talking about. And he says, it's the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. When I wrote the book, The Local Church, The Hope of the World, this is, this is where the genesis of it, these verses. Because the local church, where you're at tonight, is the pillar or the stay, the support, and then the ground or the anchor of the truth. It's, it's found in the local church. So when Paul is writing here, he's, he's showing and revealing how these ministries operate in the local church and how they affect the ones that get involved. Now, here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and notice in verse 8, Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved, then let them use, notice, the office of a deacon being blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house well. For they that have used or ministered in the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. So notice twice in verse 10 and verse 13, he says the office of a deacon. All right, now we know that, that that deacon is not a ministry gift. I mean, so when we talk about office, what we're saying is that this is a responsibility. It's part of being connected to the local church. And the word deacon, it comes from the, the Greek word diakonos, which simply means servant, all right, or it means helper. And so he says that these men, and he refers to them as men, these deacons are in an office. 
And he says that they that have functioned in this office well purchase to themselves a great degree. In other words, they have a good reputation. They, they function well in that office and they gain a good reputation from the functioning in that office. Amen. Do you see this? It's, it's a spiritual principle that when I am functioning in an office in the local church that God has given me, it begins to improve every area of my life. It begins to improve my standing. It begins to improve the way I feel about myself. That There are people even under the sound of my voice. You didn't think that much of yourself or didn't think you had that much going for you until you got a hold of the local church and started functioning in some capacity in the local church. And then you thought, wow, God really does have a plan for me. God does have something for me to do. Well, what began to happen? You entered into the office that God had called you to. You know, for some people, the office will always be in the ministry of helps. We can read from the book of Acts chapter 6. We'll look at it in a, in a moment. And, and a lot of those men that were called and placed in the first office of deacons, they went on and, and, and operated in the five-fold ministry. Not, not all of them, but many of them. But here's, here's the point. When you get involved in doing something for God in any capacity, the, what God wants you to do becomes activated in your life. All right. If I don't get involved doing something for God, then I can never enter into the fullness of what God wants me to do in my life. The local church, you helping in the local church is not about you promoting a person's agenda. It's about you getting involved in what God's doing so God can get involved in what you're doing. That, that, that is the key. Amen. Whether it's, it's greeting someone, ushering, working in the AV department, ministering in the children's department, no, no matter what I'm doing in the local church, I'm getting involved in ministering to someone and then God can get involved ministering for me and ministering to me. I remember when uh, we would go into the, the, the prisons for years, 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 years. I, I went in, and, and still do every year when I'm there uh, into the Kansas prison system. And I can remember... Uh, we were really dealing with an issue with, with one of our children, our youngest child. And, uh, you know, we were believing God for people to minister to her and people to come into her life and minister to her. And I got such a revelation from this. Every time I would go and minister to those men, I would think these are somebody's sons. These are somebody's brothers. These are somebody's friends. And when I go and I get involved ministering to them, I'm opening the door for God to open up to minister to my family and to minister to my child. Amen. But the genesis of that is getting involved in what God's doing. It, it, listen, it, it, does, it doesn't matter what capacity it may be. I've mentioned the clean team. I've mentioned the parking lot team. I've mentioned all these different teams. You know, when the men show up on Sunday morning in the parking lot team and they're out there in their nice white shirt and they're picking up trash throughout the parking lot and they're cleaning up the parking lot, they're not, they're not doing that just to clean up the parking lot. They're doing that because they want people to show up and think, wow, this church means business. They're not here just to have services. They want to improve what we're doing. They want to present themselves correctly. They're getting involved in presenting the gospel to Jesus Christ on a whole nother level. Amen. Now, people will say that doesn't sound very spiritual. I know that. But that, 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 that's where the revelation's at. When I get involved doing something that seems like a menial task and anybody could do it, well, anybody might be able to do it, but anybody's not doing it. Amen. So if nobody's doing what anybody could do, then that means somebody needs to be doing what anybody could do if they would. Amen. You're that somebody. You're that anybody that could do it. And it doesn't matter what it may be. It, I mean, it doesn't matter, matter what it is. You know, sometimes we look at things and we think, well, you know, pulpit ministry. What is pulpit ministry? You know, we think pulpit ministry, and we think somebody singing, somebody playing an instrument, somebody in the pulpit. Listen, the, the, the musician, the singer, they're just helps ministries, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, being, uh, I'm not demeaning it. 
It's, it's helps. They are anointed. They are, they are full of the presence of God and the power of God. But they're anointed to help set the atmosphere for the Word. Everything in the church is geared towards getting the Word into people's lives. We have people that come and turn the lights on, turn the air conditioner down. Why? Want you to be comfortable. For what? So you can hear the Word. We have people that come and clean the church and vacuum and make sure the bathrooms are clean and make sure everything's taken care of and the tissue boxes are full and the chairs are straight. Why? So you can come and hear the Word in a clean place. So when you go in the bathroom, it doesn't smell bad. It's clean. It's, it's, it's germ-free. It's as clean as we can make it. Why? We want you to understand that we are respectful of the people that God's bringing us and we have a helps team that wants to make sure you get the word the way you need to get the word. Amen. Do you see this? So he says twice in verse 10 and verse 13 that it's the office of a deacon. So these deacons that were appointed were recognized as being in an office. All right, so it's, it's a respectable endeavor. Amen. This word, we talked about it, diakonos, servant, especially one that waits on tables. You know, now, religion has turned the office of the deacon into something that it was never supposed to be. And you know, they, they, they basically have turned that into the board that runs the church. But the deacon was a servant that enabled the pastor to give his time to the word of God in prayer. And we'll read it in Acts 6. It says when those deacons got involved in their job and operated in their office, that what happened was the Word of God multiplied. And a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. The Word of God multiplied. Have you ever thought about that? Every time you come and you get involved in what you're doing. See, when you greet people out there at the front door, you're not just shaking hands and greeting people. You're an extension of the pastor. The pastor is welcoming that person into the church. When you usher and you help someone and you, you direct someone to a chair or you receive the offering, you're an extension of the pastor to that person. And you are enabling your man or your woman of God to give their time to the Word of God and to prayer. And what begins to happen then is the Word of God begins to multiply. Signs and wonders begin to multiply. Things begin to happen that would not happen if helps ministry was not where it should be. Amen. Listen, without a good helps ministry, a pastor's like a hand with no fingers. It's hard to get a grip on things. It's hard to do everything that needs to be done. Hallelujah. I, I've known ministers before, and I've watched over the years. And, and you know, I'm, I'm a big one to watch. I'm a big one to look at what's going on. And, and I've watched, and I've watched pastors, and, and here's what they'll say. Well, you want something done right, do it yourself. Or teach somebody how you want it done. And then it's like you doing it. Right? But that pastor that says, you want something done right, do it yourself? He's running around doing everything. He, he's running around doing everything, and he's not able to give the proper time to the Word of God and to prayer. Now listen, I love the local church. I love the people in my church. I, I want to be... I want to be there for everybody as much as I can. But I realize even churches on the scale that ours are on, I can't, I can't be at everything everybody wants me to be at, and I can't do everything everybody wants me to do, but I can train people to help me do it. Amen. I, got, I, got a, uh, I was on the phone uh, before service tonight with one of the leaders from the Kansas location, and, and a very dear person in my life passed away and, and moved to heaven. And uh, the services are tomorrow. Well, obviously, I live here. I can't be there on Thursday because I need to be there on Sunday. So uh, uh, we sent flowers, and, and the, the gentleman called me, or I called him actually tonight, and he was asking me how he wanted me to do things or how I wanted him to do things. And he's going to those services for me. And he's going to go and he's going to say, Pastor Steele sends his condolences. 
and meet with the family and meet with the church. Now, people will say, yeah, but, you know, Pastor, why is that such a big deal? Because it's enabling me to stay where I need to be, doing what I need to be doing. Amen. Do you see that? And he's operating and functioning in that office the way that he should. Every born-again believer that attends a local church is supposed to be involved in that local church in some capacity, whether it's praying for the pastor, whether it's operating in the helps ministry. You may have a five-fold ministry gift that you're supposed to be operating in. But the point is, is when you submit yourself and give yourself over to the helps ministry and you give yourself over into help making that body what it should be, then God gets involved in your life. Amen. Do you see this? So a deacon or a helps minister is one that's appointed for an ongoing or permanent service. And here's the interesting thing. Appointed by man. Look at Acts chapter 6. Am I helping you with this? Acts chapter 6. You know, I, uh, I included this in, in uh, the local church, The Hope of the World. And I, I, I taught about four benefits of church membership. And uh, uh, protection, perfection, provision, and promotion. Perfection, protection, provision, and promotion. And uh, I made a statement in there about provision. And you know, I've had people come to me before and, and say things like, you know, Pastor, uh, it just seems like it's not coming to me the way it used to. And I'll look at them and say, it's not coming to you the way it was because it's not coming from you the way it was. If it's not coming from you, it's not coming to you. Do, do you see this? It's not just about working in the church. You, you, you got to understand that. It's not just about laboring in the church. It's about understanding that as I get involved, I'm helping God do what He wants to do in that body. Every time somebody gets saved at this altar, every time somebody gets healed, every time somebody gets set free, every person on Helps Ministry gets the credit. Why? You enabled it to happen. Yeah, but I didn't lay hands on nobody. That's fine. You enabled the leadership of that body to be able to give themselves to the Word of God and to prayer so that they could minister to that person under an anointing. Amen. Do, do you see that? That's so important. Glory to God. Acts 6, did you find it? And in those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring among the Grecians against the Hebrews. Their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Well, I wonder how that would go on, go over today. Well, who's he think he is? Right? I've had people say that about their pastor. Well, you know, our pastor, before he, you know, he used to be able to vacuum the floor himself. Well, he still can. But you don't want him, you don't want your pastor vacuuming the floor. It's not that we can't. I've held every job in the church. But you don't, you, don't want, you don't want your pastor cleaning windows, taking out the trash. Amen. Because, because every, every time they're doing something along those, those lines, they're taking themselves away from something God wants to show them and give them. My responsibility, my job is to keep my spirit in tune with what God wants me to do. Amen. Amen. So he said, That's not, it's not reasonable that we should do that. So because of that, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, that we may appoint over this business. But we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So notice, he told them to look for seven men to appoint over that business. Now, I'm not saying they didn't pray. The Bible doesn't say they did. It doesn't say they, they didn't. 
But the point is, it's one appointed by man. So I've had people say, well, if the Lord would tell me to get involved, I would. Well, He is, right now. You know, the head usher might walk by you sometime. Sometime you might be sitting in church, and Tavakal will come up to you and say, have you ever thought about being an usher? Think about it. They're asking you. Amen. You, you might come in and one of the greeters will say, have you ever thought about being a greeter? Think about it. Amen. Why? You're receiving your call. Amen. Well, if the Lord would tell me, listen, if you're going to wait on the Lord to tell you everything, there's a lot of things you'll never do. Because there are things we're supposed to do that the Lord doesn't have to tell us to do. Oh, glory to God. You know, when I'm, for instance, let me say this. When I'm staying with somebody, I don't stay with people a lot anymore. But, you know, when, when I'm staying with somebody, I feel obligated because of staying with them. I'm not, I, don't, I don't just expect them to fix dinner for me and fix dinner and, and fix lunch and, and I just go eat and then wipe my mouth and get up from the table and say, thank you, and go on back about my business. No, I feel a responsibility to help with the dishes, right? To clear the table. Now, they might tell me, no, I don't want you to do that, but I'm going to try because I feel a responsibility. I ate good. I need to be involved in what's going on. You come to the local church and you eat good and you get full of the things of God. You get full of the Word. You get full of the Holy Spirit. There's a responsibility that's there to help out with what's going on. Amen. Why? To help make the dinner better. Help make the, the, the service better. Am I, am I making sense? Hallelujah. I, there, listen, there's a guy, and I've talked about him before, Steve Pitnick. The Lord, the Lord healed his body and, and gave him new cartilage in his knees. The, 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 the doctor said it was all gone, bone on bone, nothing that could be done. And one Sunday, the power of God hit him, and he started running around the church, new cartilage in his knees. When that guy got a hold of the Word of God, he was in jail. He was coming to a Bible study that, that I was doing there. And uh, he had, I mean, his family was Catholic. He had never known anything about the things of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God. I mean, he was a, 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 a drug addict from way back. I mean, he had collapsed all the veins in his arms and his legs. He was shooting dope in his, in his juggler vein. I mean, that's, that's, that's how far gone he was. And he was using old, there's a river in Kansas called the Call River, very dirty river. Call River water is what he was mixing his dope with and putting it in his juggler vein. And, and so bad that he contracted hepatitis. When he got born again, he, he had hepatitis and he went to the doctor because of some of the symptoms. And the doctor said, your liver's shot. Amen. Now he, he started working in the church almost day one. Almost day one. Man, he got a hold of the, the things of God and got busy with the things of God. And I've watched God over and over again. He is today hepatitis free. I watched God put cartilage back in his knees. Over and over and over and over again, God met the need. Now somebody will say, are you saying that's just because he's an usher? I'm saying it's because he's willing to get involved in an office and do something in the local church and God can move much easier in somebody's life that's doing something for Him as opposed to somebody that's doing nothing for Him. Hallelujah. And you know, as a pastor, as a pastor, it's, it's, it's easier to go to God and plead somebody's case that's faithful. Lord, they're faithful. I went to, I went to the Lord about that before. I had a fan, Jim and Carrie Molson, y'all know them. The, Carrie was just here Sunday. She, she don't look like somebody that died, does she? But she did. She died, and the Lord brought her back. Hallelujah. Amen. But th that couple, ever since they got a hold of the things of God, they've been busy doing for God. And when that heart issue struck her, I could immediately go to the Lord and say, Lord, they're faithful. They they're always there. Lord, I need them. I need them. I lean on them in a lot of areas. Amen. Do, do you understand? Now, I can do that for everybody, but I can't go to the Lord about everybody and say, now, Lord, they're faithful. Not just talk, I'm y'all are here, so I'm not talking about you, right? <laughs> Amen. You understand? But you, you can't do that for everybody. Do you see this? 
And, 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 and when, 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 when somebody comes to the church and they, they are greeted by a greeter that's in that office doing what God wants them to do, they walk away thinking, God, was, God met me at the door today. God met me there. Why? There's a presence of the Lord that's there. And then they go to the children's ministry and they drop their little children off and they're greeted by caring, loving, kind, anointed ministers to our children. And they walk down the hallway thinking, wow, God was in that children's ministry. What do you think their anticipation level is going to be as they're sitting in here in the sanctuary waiting on the Word of God to come? They've encountered God at the door. They've encountered God in the children's ministry. And now they're here and they're ready to receive the Word of God. That's the importance of, ch of helps ministry is we are presenting God to everybody that comes through the door. We're presenting God to every person we minister to. We're presenting Jesus Christ to every person. Before the words ever ministered, those people were ministered to. Before the word ever comes forth. Amen. Glory to God. Do you see this? So deacons were those servants, those those. Helpers. So in helps ministry, God's at the door. God's in the nursery. Sunday I was so blessed. I went to get Lily out of the nursery. And Miss Gloria and I think, was it Mary was, was helping in the nursery? And I don't know, we had several little kids in the nursery that day. Six or seven. Man, that was such a blessing. I, I went in there and they had all been ministered to. They had all been blessed. They had all, they had all, all had... And, and exposure to the Word of God. Hallelujah. You know, heaven will only know the people that you touched doing something for God in whatever capacity it was. How many, how many people are going to show up in heaven and are going to say, I went back to that church and my life was irrevocably changed because the usher, when I came in and didn't know where to sit, instead of making me feel silly, he found me a good seat and set me down and blessed me and, and told me where everything was. How many people are going to show up in heaven and say, I had totally written church off, but I went to that church and that greeter was so sweet and that greeter was so kind and that greeter was so wonderful and loving and compassionate that when I came in, they didn't care how I looked, they didn't care how I smelled, they didn't care what was going on in my life, they didn't care what color I was, they didn't care where I had failed, they welcomed me into the house of God, gave me a place to sit, gave my children somewhere to be ministered to and helped me turn my life around. Hallelujah. Do you see that? And people will come to the local church. And, and very often, they're quick to, to talk about the pastor and give the pastor credit. But I've come to understand something a long time ago, years ago. We're a body. We're a body. And, 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 and the head, I know the head is responsible for determining direction. But you know, my body loves my arm. My body loves my leg. My body loves my eyes. And my body needs every part to keep functioning the way that it should function. You're here because of the Word, but you're also here because of the body. You're here because of relationships. You're here because God's moving in your life through the people that are sitting around you. Oh, glory to God. I'm almost done. Ministers of helps and helps ministry workers as a whole are responsible for helping and protecting those God has set in church as pastors. You're helping, you're, you're, you're protecting. Amen. You're, you're making the job of ministering to God's people so much easier. Hallelujah. It's such a blessing to know. You know, when we get up in the pulpit on Sunday, we don't have to be concerned. Are our children being ministered to correctly? They're hearing the Word. Are our babies in the nursery, are they being ministered to correctly? They're hearing the Word of God. It's such a blessing to come in here on Wednesday night and see Larry and Anna back there and, and Carlos and Jean and they're putting things together and getting the music together and they're studied up and they're prayed up and they're anointed and they're ministering the gospel to our young people. Here's the issue. It's such a blessing. I don't have to be concerned about that. I can be here and ministering to you. Amen. Glory to God. 
The helps ministry lifts up and supports the pastor. That's so important. That's so important. There's a, a minister in, in my life that's very special to me, very, very special to me, and I love him dearly. But he's one of those ministers. He just, he's got to do everything himself. And when I'll meet with him and have dinner with him and, and visit with him, he's always telling me how wore out he is and he's tired. And now he's talking about wanting to go to heaven. Well, I don't want to lose him. But how do you look at somebody and say, you're doing everything? They're, see, that's a protection. That's a protection. I will have pastors ask me to come preach at their church and what they want me to come in and do is to minister to their people about how to treat their pastor. I'm not the one that should come in and tell people how to treat their pastor. He should tell people how to treat their pastor. One of the first messages I preached here on a Wednesday night was, Call me pastor. People say, What do I call you? Pastor. Well, what if I want to call you Philip? Then you only get what Philip has. I mean, that, that you know, if, if I'm just Philip to you, then you just get what Philip can give you. If I'm Brother Steele to you, you just get what Brother Steele can give you. But if I'm your pastor, you get whatever's in that gift. Amen. Hallelujah. I had, some, I had somebody come to the church one time. You know what they said? They, they said, I'm only here because of Pastor Michelle. I mean, I've had people tell me, you're not my favorite preacher. I'm just here because of Pastor Michelle. I don't care why you're here as long as you're here. As long as the word's, as long as the word's changing you. Amen. I've had, I've had people talk about how one of the associate ministers was one of their favorite preachers. I don't care. As long as, as, long as the word's changing you. Amen. But, but understand something. Here's what I'm saying. When you tap in and that person becomes your pastor and you get behind the vision of that church, then what's on that person's life begins to flow in you. I'm going to tell you this. I'm, taking a, a, I'm going a little over our hour of power, but not very much. I only got one more comment. Listen to me. Listen to me. Something, I'm telling you, when you get involved in the vision of this church and you get involved in the anointing on this church, I'm going to tell you, you can't lose. And I'm, and I'm going to tell you why. I can't lose. You, I'm going to tell you this, and you do whatever you want to with it. You are hooked up to me, and you can't fail. You can't fail. People say, how can you say that? Because I know the anointing on, that's on my life. I can fall in an outhouse and come out smelling like a rose. The favor of God is on our life. Amen. And what people begin to do is they, they look around and they see a growing church and they see a church that's coming up to another level and they see a church that's building on the Word of God. Amen. Listen, I know how to pack this building out in a week. I could, I could get special singers in here. I could get special guests in here and we could pack out the, the church every night. And then on Sunday morning, all those people that came to hear that special guest would be back at their church. And we would still have the faithful. We're going to build this church on the Word of God, on the moving of the Holy Spirit, and on the vision of what God gave us. It is not the fastest way to build the church, but it is the most solid way to build the church. And then once the church starts growing bigger, there's a foundation that's laid. You've got to understand something. I'm telling you as your pastor, I'm here for the long haul. I'm here for the rest of my life. What God has asked me to do is what we're going to do. This is not a flash in the pan. This is not an, an effort, a tryout. This is we're going to do what God told us to do. He said, you go build a Word of Faith church in Little Rock, Arkansas, and that's what we're doing, and that's what God's going to bless. Glory to God. The pastor is benefited by having the task of the ministry performed. Now notice, here's the key. By an anointed assistant or assistants that are called to minister alongside. There's an anointing to usher. There's an anointing to greet. People say, well, well what about the AV? Are they anointed? Yes. I got an email today from a lady that we first, and, and I'll share this with you and try to hush, but I love teaching on the local church. 
And she got a hold of us. She was a, a Mennonite. And uh, called to preach, called the pastor, but in the Mennonite denomination. Well, that don't fly in the Mennonite church. Well, she got a hold of my series that I do on the web called Pastoring Essentials. And it really started ministering to her. Well, she started watching everything that we had. Well, here's the thing. Her son contracted cancer in Florida. She's with him in Florida now. And he is living on our healing school. Just ingesting it every time it's on. Every time it's on. And I get emails from her constantly saying, I don't know what we would do. He can't get out and go to church. I don't know what we would do without your YouTube channel. So every time they flip the switch back there and we're live and we're going, we're going into, into to cyberspace, somebody in Fort Lauderdale, Florida that has been diagnosed with a deadly disease is hearing the Word of God and their life is being changed. Now what if we didn't have Janessa and, and Eric and Pastor Denise and Pastor Eric, what if we didn't have them back there flipping the switch, turning it on? What, what if we were one of those churches that said, that just don't matter? Somebody's not going to get fed. I got, I got an email from a, a, a ministry leader in Australia that's been watching Pastor in Essentials. How much it's ministering to them. Hallelujah. Do, do you see this? Every time, every time, you come to church and you get involved in your office. Well, you know, all I, I, you know I, I don't do much. I just help out in the prayer lines or whatever. Yeah, but you're enabling the anointing to flow. Do, do you know when a pastor that's anointed by, by the power of God, and all of them are, but uh, there's a healing anointing on our ministry. And every time I lay hands on somebody in a prayer line, I don't have to worry about what's going to happen to them. I got good ushers that if they fall out in the spirit, they're going to they're going to they're going to gently lay them down. I've got somebody going to come and cover them, keep their keep their posterity and keep their their you know keep them where they need to be. People say, "Well, how is that such a big help?" I don't have to be concerned about it. I can let that anointing flow. Amen. And guess what? Every usher, every, every, every person that's helping up here, cover cloths, whatever it is, every time you're up here, you're under that same anointing. And I'm going to tell you something in closing. And the anointing is caught more than it's taught. You catch the anointing. You, and, and you cannot get around it consistently that it don't start rubbing off on you. Amen. I'll close with this. Elisha caught Elijah's anointing. See, there, there, there's, there's, there's a symbol there. Yeah, he got the mantle that fell and physically got it. But how did he catch that anointing? How, how was he in a position to catch that anointing? Operating in the ministry of helps. After Elijah went to heaven and the king of Israel and the king of Judah got in trouble, the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, he said, Is there a prophet here that we may inquire at him of the Lord? And they said, Well, there is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, watch, that poured water on Elijah's hands. I ask my leaders this all the time. What if in your ministry, the greatest thing they could say about you is that you served your pastor? That's what they said about Elisha. He poured water on Elijah's hand. And he went on and, and had at least double the miracles that we know of that Elijah had. Right? At least double. Well, here's the point. So when you come and you usher and you greet, you do AV, you're in student ministry, nursery ministry, parking lot team. Yeah, but you know, I'm just out there waving at people as they come in. You are out there being... The, the vision of Jesus. You're out there being somebody that's welcoming them into the parking lot. It's, it's not like they're going to Subway and nobody cares as long as they buy a sandwich. We care enough to have somebody out there saying, God bless you. Good morning. Let me help you find a parking spot. You have now become the hands and the feet of Jesus. Amen. Did, do you see that? 
And whatever it is, there's an anointing there. And it's not going to be long. We're going to see miracles in the parking lot. It's not going to be long. We're going to see miracles in, in the foyer, miracles in the, in the bathroom. One of the ushers is going to walk in. Somebody's not going to feel well or somebody's going to have a problem. And you're going to be led by the Spirit to pray for them. Can I do that? You can. That's your job. You're not sitting under this anointing for no reason. Amen. Boy, I hope I helped you. Praise God. Let's stand up tonight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe God. I believe God. Hallelujah. Now, brother, I've, I've met you before, and I got something from the Lord to say to you. And this is exactly what he said to me. If you won't give up, and you'll steal yourself to get through what you've been facing. God is going to pour out up on you blessings in such an abundant measure, it's going to change the face of what you want to do for God. It's going to change it. But there's going to, now listen, there's going, there's going to be a little bit longer of this challenge you've been facing. But if you'll just set your face like a flint and get through it, God's about to pour out abundance on you. I believe God. I believe God. Amen? I believe God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, don't forget, obviously, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, Sunday night, 6 o'clock. We're going to have a great, great time prayer at 930. And uh, God's good to us. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight. Let's say our vision, shall we? The vision of this church is to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. You and I will always be world changers. God bless you.